everybody. Welcome to the second session of Cleveland OpenCon. And um, we have another exciting session with a session planned here. Our next presenter is Anna Bendo. And um, um, there are several panel members who will present along with her. Anna Bendo is a director of affordable learning initiatives at Ohio Link. And uh, her co-presenters will introduce themselves as they take their turn to speak. So I will um, turn this over to Anna. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> we have done this back and forth Anna presentation several times in the past couple of years. So thank you. And thanks to all the folks uh, at Cleveland State for putting on another wonderful OpenCon conference. It's a great opportunity for all of us in Ohio and beyond to be able to share what we're working on and some of the projects that we're doing and hear from others and learn. So I appreciate you all continuing to do this year after year and giving us that chance. So I'm just gonna do a brief introduction uh, because I am not the one with all the info here that my panelists who will introduce themselves and their projects as we move along have really been the ones that have put the work into this project. So I just wanted to give a little overview of what we were trying to do at Ohio Link with this project and then I'll have them share their experience. So we're gonna talk about the Ohio Link OER course redesign mini grants that we gave this spring. Um, so just as an overview at Ohio Link, what problem were we trying to solve? So over the past five years now, with our affordable learning initiatives, we've given 25 plus workshops to introduce folks to affordable learning and OER and other options. And what we always find is that faculty are really, really interested in OER and um, providing those cost savings and other benefits that OER brings, but the lack of time that they have available to make that shift and the lack of funding to compensate them for that time can be a, a big challenge. So that was one thing we were trying to look at helping with. Where did we find the inspiration for this program? Well, two of the folks that are on this call um, or this Zoom right now, Cleveland State University did a similar program called their Textbook Affordability Symposium uh, in the summer of 2021. And I also uh, talked with Anna Davis and uh, Lindsay Mason and Michelle Sharp from Ohio Dominican University who did a similar uh, program for their faculty in the summer of 2021. And that kind of helped me develop our program at Ohio Link. We also received a small amount of funding from the Midwest Higher Education Compact, which is otherwise known as MEC. They got a grant from the Hewlett Foundation to promote OER in their Midwest state membership. And so they were giving out small chunks of money to each state to do some kind of initiative with. And so this is what we proposed and they agreed. So originally I was gonna be able to fund about six to eight faculty members to have a small stipend to do this program. But then when we got so many applicants and there was such an interest in this, Ohio Link also kicked in 13,000 extra dollars to really be able to uh, award as many of these stipends as we could. So we had faculty apply. Um, I had about over 40 um, and the 29 that were chosen were from 15 different Ohio Link institutions. It included two-year institutions, four-year independents, public, small, large. So we really I think hit a lot of different faculty, or I'm sorry, institution types throughout the state, um, different disciplines that people wanted to focus on, uh, education, business, sociology, history, fashion, theater, art, economics, chemistry, philosophy, literature, healthcare and nursing, writing and public speaking. So some courses that I knew there was OER available in and some that I was really hoping there were <laughs> OER available in. And the range of courses was from introductory to upper level courses as well. So what faculty were applying to do was to re receive a $600 stipend to take a three week long online Canvas course on an introduction to OER, which a lot of the content was borrowed from Cleveland State's similar uh, program that they did. So we did that in March. There were discussion posts, quizzes, online assignments, and they were gonna look at a specific course syllabus from one of the courses that they taught and try to find OER in that area that they could use to replace either some or all of the course materials that they were currently using. Um, and so there was also an OER review involved with it and then building the course out and mapping some of that OER to their objectives. And then at the end, there was a kind of 
uh, two page final report that sort of explained their experience. Now, not all of this um, was due until May 31st. So some people are still working on finishing up those, um, uh, those requirements as well. We also uh, required one synchronous Zoom, Zoom session. Wow, I couldn't get that out. Just so faculty could get together and talk about what their experience was and ask any questions that they might have. Each faculty member received some um, suggestions of OER from an OER librarian, Mandy Goodset at CSU, who's on this call, helped us with this. And she gave some great suggestions of where people could get started. And then once all the requirements are submitted, the stipends will be distributed. So just a little bit about the cohort. There were 29 faculty. Um, what I did was ask folks in their application how many students typically take their course and then how much money they spend typically on course materials for that course. And I kind of compiled it all together. And if every single course converted to OER, which I know, you know, not everyone is going to be able to do that perfectly, but if they did, we would save 4,000 students over $300,000 each year. And that's in addition to all the other benefits that OER can bring as well. We also wanted this to be a pilot program, so not a one and done, um, to use it as a model for other grant programs. And I do feel really confident that we're gonna be able to do that. We've gotten some positive feedback at Ohio Link and through ODHE that they wanna fund this program again. And then also that this course, this um, online course about OER could be used more widely with other faculty throughout the state. And we have actually had that happen as well as someone has requested to use the modules for an individual institution specific initiative. So I feel like some of our goals have been met already. And just some feedback I got, um, quotes from emails that I received. This is an incredible opportunity. I'm enjoying the exploration of all things OER. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is inspiring work. And I've asked Mandy to assist me in finding OER for other courses. That was really, uh, rewarding to hear. And this course was a really transformative process for me. And I greatly appreciate getting to engage in this opportunity. So um, it has been nice to hear from folks that they have found it useful. I'm sure depending on where you were on the continuum of knowing nothing about OER to already knowing a lot, you know, probably uh, colored your experience with, uh, with the course itself, but have gotten some great feedback and some suggestions for additional um, things we could do in the future. So I'm going to have each faculty member introduce themselves and where they're from and talk a little bit about what their specific course and experience was. And then I have some questions that they can respond to after that. So we'll just go um, alphabetical from who was on my uh, initial slide. So um, Patrick, we're going to start with you, if that's OK. Yeah, totally fine. Uh, so hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. And uh, also, thanks for the opportunity to kind of share what I've you know, been able to do through the program. Um, I originally applied to it because I'm a first year uh, philosophy faculty at Central State University in Ohio, uh, which is an HBCU for those who maybe might be unfamiliar with, uh, with the school. And one of our gen ed classes that almost every student takes is critical thinking, a 2000 level or 200 level philosophy course. Um, and because so many students take the class and because you know we're finally starting to be able to build the philosophy program for the first time in about 15 years um i wanted to redesign the class and i wanted to try to use oer textbooks for it since critical thinking textbooks are usually astronomically expensive um, and also not always designed in exactly the way that things need to be taught. And especially because it's an HBCU, you can't just map on, you know, critical thinking courses from PWIs to these student populations, right? You have to kind of know your students. So I wanted to know what, you know, uh, resources were, were out there. And I had a little bit of experience with OERs before the program. Um, I have a graduate certificate in online and blended instruction. And I've also made some teaching modules in computer science ethics that are OER and available online um, under a Creative Commons licensing. So I had a little bit of experience with it, but not a not like sort of a, a, a rigorous training in it, you know, start to finish. So um, so that was another thing that really appealed to me about the the project. Um, um, and so in doing this, I reviewed about 
a half a dozen or so critical thinking textbooks that were OER, read through them, and um, of course part of the, pro uh, the program was to write a review of one. This last semester I was using one OER textbook and critical thinking in my own class, so I decided to review a, a textbook that I didn't use so that way you know I could have the opportunity to learn more about it and um, essentially what I think I've been able to figure out is that for a course like critical thinking there's not one textbook that's going to work I'm going to have to patch together materials from several different textbooks on this and maybe even some other outside materials the discipline of philosophy itself there's a dearth of OER materials for the discipline in general. And um, even though there are some you know, decent critical thinking materials out there, um, there's so many different ways to teach the class that you, know, you kind of have to figure out, well, this section of this book works for this topic and this section of this book works for this topic and might have to patch them together um, in that way. Uh, but that also is a little bit freeing because what that means is that you don't have to assign a textbook, skip half the chapters in it, and then supplement it with other materials. And now the students have bought a textbook that they're only using half of. So they're only getting $75 of their $150 worth of, of money or whatever the case may be. And so, um, so that was sort of one thing that I found in, in all of this. Um, Another thing is that critical thinking is a little bit different than other philosophy classes. Most philosophy classes are highly qualitative in that they're sort of like uh, history or English classes. You read a text, you interpret it. And so, you know, there's not a lot of quizzes, especially not a lot of multiple choice quizzes. So there's not a lot of question banks and things like this that I was able to come across just in my cursory glancing at, at everything. Um, but I also think that that means that there might be an opportunity here, especially for critical thinking, for faculty to develop these kinds of materials because critical thinking is the kind of philosophy class where sometimes quizzes can actually, you know, fit the, um, you know, fit the material quite well. Um, and then sort of beyond just that immediate use of, of my training in this program, um, I'm actually the lead faculty for the philosophy program. I'm in a department of humanities, so we just have a couple of philosophy uh, professors, but um, our department encompasses philosophy, English, history, international languages and culture and communications. And so I'm the lead on the philosophy program. And what I wanted to do this summer is get an in-house grant at Central State to redesign our four gen ed philosophy classes around OERs. And there's an institutional push at Central State to have the whole entire um, gen ed curriculum built around OERs. So I thought, well, what, what a great place to start this other than philosophy. So we're trying to actually set a precedent for the rest of the university on this. And so over the summer, I'm working with two other faculty. I'm going to sort of share with them what I learned from the program. And together, we're going to um, revise four classes and build master course shells for them all. And these classes include Introduction to Global Philosophy, Introduction to Global Religion, um, Contemporary Moral Issues, uh, which is like an introductory ethics class, and, um, and the critical thinking course that I was speaking of before. So that's kind of how I came into the program. That's some of the basic things I learned from it. And those are, and those are a few of the ways that I'm going to try to apply what I learned. And hopefully, you know, this will help set me on a, a trajectory to be more involved in other kinds of things like this conference um, when it comes to, to OERs um, and their production, their access and everything like that. So thank you. Thanks, Patrick. I'm happy to hear about the project for the summer. That's wonderful. Uh, all right, I think I have Kathleen Bryan next. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for allowing me to share my experience with this project. Uh, I am the program coordinator of the early childhood birth to age five. So think of the childcare uh, industry. I'm the program coordinator of this program at the University of Cincinnati. And um, I've been passionate about trying to reduce the cost of textbooks for the students in our program because as uh, many of you know, the uh, birth to five 
uh, world is uh, very low paying as far as careers are concerned. And when they decide to get an advanced degree, which for many people could be just an associate degree, uh, hopefully a bachelor's degree, um, textbook cost is one of the biggest things that prohibit them from doing so. So uh, I, I have been using, uh, I have a little experience with OER, but didn't understand the why or the how. Um, and so this project really gave me the foundational information that allowed me to uh, explain and, and, and uh, know why we were, were going to continue to pursue this. I had a very specific course in mind when I applied for this program. And um, uh, it, it, it was a, a course that the textbook that we have been using is, is out of print and uh, there's no new editions being written. So um, we were with, at a loss for that, but uh, the, the template that I was given at the very beginning was the best start I could have gotten, um, found several resources that will fit in this course. It's a very um, uh, field specific course. It's actually called the Operations of an Early Childhood Program for someone that wants to start a program or be a director of a program. And so there's some very specific information as far as, you know, how to write a business plan and things like that. So it was, it was kind of an unusual course. So what this has led me to do is I'm going to use an open um, source material for the, the foundational knowledge of this course. But then it led me to find some very, very inexpensive resources, very practical in nature from the national uh, organization that accredits early childhood programs. And I will be able to um, take it from like a $200 textbook down to a $27, very practical handbook kind of um, cost and, and using uh, the resources that I learned from this project. It, um, I do also plan to share my experience at the Higher Education Summit that we have for early childhood in September. There are people from all over the state that will attend the Early, early Childhood Summit. Um, it's been virtual the last couple of years. It's going to be in person this year. So I, I, I expect there to be a, a, a great response to this. And, and I might even suggest that there's a, an opportunity for some grant work there too. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, Pam Epler. Did she jump on? I didn't see her name when I was scrolling through. All right, we're gonna we're gonna skip over Pam for now. Hopefully, she'll join us, and then we'll come back if she jumps on the call. Um, Liz Golba. Hi, my name is Liz Golba, and I'm from Kettering College, um, just south of Dayton, Ohio. Um, I am the program chair for the Bachelors of Health Science completion where those have associate degrees are coming back working to um, achieve a Bachelors in Health um, Science. Those involved are people who are working in a health science field such as radiology technology, sonography, respiratory therapy, um, in some cases, I do teach an interdisciplinary course with um, associate degree nursing students. I've had PA students. I've also had medical assisting students and lab students. Um, I also am in charge of the actual um, associate director of the Division of Online and Continuing Education at our college. The reason why I actually looked at Ohio Link. Again, Ann Bendino came and spoke at a faculty forum in the fall at her college, and that kind of perked my interest along with our reference librarian, Kathy Sagato, really pushed um, for faculty to actually pursue this. But the main reason is the high cost of textbooks. I teach a course called Legal and Ethical Issues in Healthcare, and the textbook that I currently use, the edition changes about every other year. And I found that the cost of the textbook was anywhere from $100 to $150. And the students only use the textbook for my course. It is not used for another course at the college. Um, so I basically wanted to reduce textbook costs and try to use more open education resources throughout this course. I also found that with healthcare, and legal and ethical issues, there's very limited amount of even open education resources available 
um, through my search, I found a lot on business, but nursing. And again, my students um, that are in healthcare, they aren't nurses. And so I did not want to pull anything that just pertained to nurses. So healthcare in general, there was a real um, need and demand. So I was able to take a lot of what I already had that I didn't even realize that were open educational resources that I had developed with um, dilemmas, medical dilemmas, um, some different um, resources that I already had in the course. And I was like, well, I already have this developed and look outside and um, pursue videos, um, other written resources to try to put the whole course together um, without using the textbook. And I felt like I was pretty successful in doing that. And um, I look forward to launching this course in the fall of 2022. It's a seven week course that so will be taught the second um, half of the semester, but I found this really beneficial and I'm really excited to see what kind of feedback I get from other faculty at the college as well as my students. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Gwen Gray Schwartz. Hi, everybody. I'm Gwen, and I teach at the University of Mount Union. We're a little bit east of um, Canton. And one of the things, um, so I basically had maybe four takeaways. Um, the course I selected was Introduction to Creative Writing. I teach in our Literature and Communication Arts Department. Um, we have had a writing major for many years, and now it is just a minor. Um, but we teach the Intro to Creative Writing class um, for many, many students on campus because it counts as one of their fine arts credits in our gen ed program. So we gear it towards any kind of student coming into the university that may need to learn a little bit about storytelling um, and trying to apply it to what they're doing in other careers. And then, of course, some students just want to write, which is awesome. Um, so one of the things that I found very early on was that we have a problem um, with copyright. So when you're dealing with OER, you are maybe looking for texts. Um, and in the creative writing world, you're, you're dealing with authors, writers. And so whatever they're producing creatively, they have copyright on. And so even if that's going into a textbook, it's not often going to wind up in an OER textbook. Um, we have a, a few um, that I reviewed, and they often used very, very old, often dead white male uh, writers whose copyrights have expired. Um, and that's not the kind of writing that we try to show to introductory students um, because it's not as engaging to them as more contemporary writers would be. So the benefit to finding that out very early on was that um, similar to what I think Patrick said is that oftentimes you're not going to find a textbook that's a, a it fits all of your needs um, in an OER course. And so you're going to maybe take bits and pieces, which is fine, but it's hard. Uh, but the hardness led me to finding all sorts of other avenues where these resources are. So it might be, um, on different uh, literary websites that are more current, run by, um, I'm going to say younger people. <laughs> um, I can say that now, because I'm not. Um, and so they're doing a lot of things that is more than just uh, publishing and showing creative writing. They're actually, a lot of them are more interested in activism um, and DEIB uh, efforts. And so there's a confluence of things happening all at once, which is, pretty awesome um, for me at least because I try to help my students see that creative writing is really a place for people to not only just show um, what cultures are experiencing but also to push places into new directions and to call out injustices and so some of those places might be um, a literary journal that has um, one part of it that is archives from older issues um, where uh, writers have said, yes, you can put my whatever example of this up um, for everyone to read without uh, the subscription wall being hit. So I can link to something like that and have students find that perfectly well. Also um, leading into more performance-based locations. So we have 
perhaps um, there's the International Poets in Conversation website, which allows students to hear poets read from all over the world. Sometimes they're reading in their own language. Sometimes they're reading in English, um, but they're also in conversation with another poet about what they were trying to do. And so students who have never experienced how poetry sounds, um, except for maybe in high school and they're trying to read something that, that is usually pretty old. Um, this was very eye-opening for them. The third thing that I got uh, out of this project was it moved me into more public spaces for publishing. And so one of the things we've been trying to do with our students is to have them understand that because everybody is writing everywhere now, um, that also applies to creative writing for good or for bad. So early on in the semester, I have them write a poem, whatever they think poetry is, and they publish it to some random poetry website, which publishes really bad poems because it takes everyone. Um, and so that in itself is an OER. And then we use that site to talk about some of the ways that creative writing can actually be useful for people, um, especially if the person has taken some time to learn about uh, what makes poetry, for instance, um, more effective than some other types of writing. So uh, publishing and being part of that public um, conversation about language is super helpful. But in the same vein, um, I'm doing a project that came out of this grant this fall with the class, Intro to Creative Writing, my section of it, where students are going to find sample texts. Um, we teach a four genre class, so it's poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, and drama. And they will find examples of these things um, in the OERs that we have found um, for them. And we are going to create our own OER uh, based on our sampling of text. So while it'll act like a course textbook for us in a way, we will also publish it so that others can use it in the future. Um, and this is something that I learned through this grant is that having students not only be agents of their own education in terms of learning, but in terms of deciding and showing what they want to share with others um, can be very, very useful. So building that as part of my pedagogy um, is a really fantastic part of the OER movement as far as I'm concerned. And one of the things that we're working with uh, right now is hypothesis. Um, that was on one of the recent <laughs> Slack chats um, at this conference and how people are using it as a way to um, increase reading engagement with students and the collaborative nature of learning. Um, and so when you're using web resources rather than textbook resources, especially if those textbooks are not part of your uh, learning management system, because then there's a fee for hypothesis. But if you're just using web versions of texts, you can get hypothesis for free and have that really wonderful interchange about reading, which then in my class helps with writing. So lots of really good stuff going on with this OER. I'm so happy I, I was part of it. Um, and my one of my librarians, Abby Noland, um, is helping me create. Um, she's actually creating it. I'm just feeding her information. Um, a LibGuide uh, resource for our students at my school. So thanks so much. And if anybody wants to work on or contribute to um, some creative writing uh, texts, please get in touch with me because I have one going on Rebus now, which I just started this week. Wow, thanks, Gwen. It's making me want to sign up for your course in the yeah. fall. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Molly Wang. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Molly Wong. I am from Kent State University. Uh, I'm a professor at chemistry and biochemistry department. Um, I have always been thinking about how to welcome our students to higher education by supporting the students affordability um, for their learning materials. And also, how do we increase the equitable access for our students education? Um, it turns out OER is such an efficient way to do this. 
Uh, that's why I was super happy when I see the call for proposals from the OER uh, Ohio link. So I was quite excited because, you know, it's I think it's more structured way um, to get me know more familiar about the OER. So that's why um, I applied. Um, and meanwhile, I was working as a provost fellow in the provost office. Uh, so we start talking about OER. Um, so I shared this news with the provost and then we were able um, to send out uh, the information uh, to the faculties in the university uh, with conjunction with the librarian's help. Um, and then very luckily, I think uh, a few of our faculties in our universities all got the grant and then with the casual talk with them, I think they are all very happy they learned so much uh, from this grant. Um, so um, we are we were working on this um, project and meanwhile in our university we try to promote this OER initiative in our uh, campus as well. Uh, so what we did is we formed up a com committee um, and then we have already lined up the following plans for those initiative. So for instance, um, we just recently published a call for proposals for faculties who are interested in um, the OER areas. Um, and then I think our librarian, Cindy, contacted Anna and Mandy. So we are planning to offer uh, a similar uh, courses regarding to the OER for our faculties and also uh, OER Summit. Um, so our faculties can get prepared and they will apply, um, you know, the grant from our own university and then put their work into uh, there. Um, so I think it's a very successful way to do and I was very glad through this grant procedures I have learned so much and that I can share um, or guide our colleagues in our university. Uh, my own project is I'm trying to search um, and adopt the OERs for my uh, general chemistry one classes. And this class actually we have high enrollment um, and that our textbook is always expensive. The students sometimes try to avoid buying the textbook and we all know the learning outcomes cannot be reached if they are not using the textbook and then if they're not reading the textbook and doing the exercise from there. So I think it's a great opportunity for me to, uh, to try to search some available OER materials to use in my classes. Um, and then uh, through this grant, I think um, I feel very helpful taking the Canvas courses. So I can't help just to share with you about some of the modules we learn from the Canvas courses. Um, I think we were introduced to what is OER and why we use the OER and we learned uh, what are some of the creative common licenses and also the copyright basics, etc. Um, and also we were paired with the librarian to have a list of resources which we can be used for those courses. Um, and then we were able to go through the list and then we searched um, the course materials and also we uh, we were um, evaluating uh, OER resources we found out um, and also in the Canvas training we learned how to map affordable learning materials to our um, objective learning goals in our courses so I really feel um, this is really helpful it build up the foundation for us to push this work uh, forward, so it's very beneficial. Um, and then, unlike uh, Patrick and Gwen, I was very lucky. I was um, very um, surprised to find out there are good resources. And one of the textbook actually is called Chemistry um, um, Adam First, which is the second edition. It's very surprisingly the contents lined up very well with the current textbook I am using. Um, so that's, I was very happy about that. And I was, I'm hoping um, I can dig into 
furthermore, to eventually adapt this um, materials for my future teaching. Um, and also, I have other colleagues who teaches the same classes on the campus. So my goal is um, I will share the information with them and hopefully we found we will find some common ground there so we can use the same um, textbook for our students. Um, and I think one of the challenges for um, for my experience learning the OER is um, the textbook. It's um, very nice to be adopted. However, uh, I think there are certain exercise problems or uh, the online homework system or even um, you know, the other text bank resources where uh, I would not be able to find the one match what we uh, wanted. So maybe in the future we can explore more and maybe writing the, um, the OER materials for ourselves. Um, in general, I think this is such a rewarding grant. Um, so it's not only I learn so much for myself, but also uh, with the guidance about the, you know, the grant design, the, the design, I was able to spread the word and then to push this uh, initiatives around our campuses. So thank you very much for providing us the opportunity to work on this grant. And also, um, I was very lucky to know um, some of the colleagues uh, which are on this grant. So we were able to share our thoughts on information. Um, I'm hoping if you know if you're on the call and you're in the chemistry disciplinary, um, if you want to get touch with me, we can share the information. We can discuss discuss further about OER. That will be fantastic. And again, thanks so much for this opportunity. Thanks, Molly. And I will say yes, you have done such an amazing job of advocacy for OER at Kent State. So I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's thank you. spreading like wildfire. And I yeah. really, really love to see that. So thank you. And I have spoken with Cindy, who's the librarian, and she wants to use the modules for a faculty specific mm -hmm. project. So it's going to be great. Yeah. Okay. So I want to make sure that we um, offer the opportunity for folks who have a question. Um, if you want to put it in the chat, we could add those to these as well. I just kind of put these together ahead of time, but I know some of them the panelists have already addressed. Um, Gwen, I will say I did see someone write in the chat that they were interested in your hypothesis project, if you would be willing to share. So um, you might want to respond to that one. Um, the one that, question of my list here, ah, bring it back up. Uh, that I think maybe we haven't looked at quite as much is kind of what advice would you give to someone who wants to start this work, but maybe is feeling a little overwhelmed because they're maybe they know their course is a really specific or a higher level and there might not be OER readily available. What are some good um, suggestions you could give as a starting point or, you know, how do they get started with this work? And anyone can jump in. <laughs> I'll start because there's a really easy way to start. Uh, go to your librarian. There's someone on your campus who uh, knows OERs very well, or at least knows enough to get you started. And they can point you to some of the, the basic sites um, that are either textbook oriented or just um, overall material oriented. Thank you. Yeah, that's a huge... And I know a lot of the people on this call are either librarians or work closely with them. So they love hearing that advice as well. So thank you for that. Um, Anyone else have a suggestion? Anna, if I can add on that, I think, you know, consulting with the librarian is the most important thing. Uh, but also I'm a really big fan of your Canvas courses. I think, you know, after I take the Canvas courses, a lot of basic concepts, I grasp them very well. So it kind of gave me the direction, how do you design your courses and then where are the possible resources? So I would definitely advocate uh, the Canvas courses um, you have offered. Um, and also I think the other way I would like to suggest is maybe communicate uh, with the faculty seeing uh, your area, your, in your university to see whether they have some uh, information or experience for this one. Uh, that's why I was thinking 
after we um, finish this grant, so we will be advocating for this process and we may be able to be the mentor for them, whoever want to develop some other courses. So I think the collaborating is really important. Um, we, as a higher education, we know we have the freedom to choose our textbooks, but if we can have a team working together, um, you know, to use, to adopt maybe the similar textbooks, I think that costly, they will save even more. Um, so I think that will be helpful. That's just my two cents. I was going to add a recommendation that um, Mandy's position be permanent. <laughs> I, I could not have begun this process uh, without the template that Mandy provided with some of the legwork uh, ahead of time. It gave me a, a real great place to start. And while I think the University of Cincinnati librarians probably could do this, um, I wouldn't even know how to approach them to say, can you give me a head start on this? I don't know. But uh, that, you know, I don't know if Mandy would be able to be a permanent uh, part of this for the state, but I think it's a great, she provided a great resource and just um, gave me a place to start from. I think that's a really good point in that, um, you know, Mandy is a librarian that has a lot of experience in OER and that, you know, we're not always coming from the same place with, you uh, knowledge of resources in that area. So making sure that you're working with a librarian that has that kind of knowledge, or if not, you know, you could reach out to me and I could probably put you in touch with someone that could help. So um, I think that's a great point. And I love the idea of uh, have, <laughs> having Mandy available. I'm going to have to work on that. <laughs> um, I also wanted to say the collaboration piece, Molly, I think is a really good one as well. So, you know, talking with faculty on your campus to see if they're already doing work in this area, especially if it's a big campus, there might be folks that have some experience and you might not even be aware that they're they're using it already. So I think, I think that's a great point as well. Um, all right, I wanna be conscious of our time here. Does anyone have um, suggestions or additional questions that you wanna put in the chat? Um, yeah, I really, I, I love Kathleen this point and Joanna is backing it up. A, a dedicated librarian at the state level for helping with OER when time permits is, is a really important tool, I think, because you know not every campus has the same resources in that area. So yes. Any, any other questions or any other thoughts? My faculty panelists, anything else you wanna um, convey with our, with our audience here while we have them? I would just say work on creating some That's materials cool. because if you're looking around and you're not finding any, you know, it's just like with published research. Oh, I looked through the literature. There's no work on this. So, you know, it's the gap in the literature thing. And then you say, well, now I'm going to do some work on that. Well, if you look around and you don't see any OER textbooks on that, you know, on your topic in that class, in that subject area, you know, try to make them. Uh, the first OERs that I made, I didn't know that's what I was doing until afterwards. And then I, in retrospect, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know? <laughs> so then after that, I was like, okay, now I'm going to do a textbook on this and a textbook on this because I started seeing that even the, you know, sort of standard textbooks in those fields, I was like, they're not, you know, they're not great and they're certainly not $90 great, you know? Well, I can, at least create something that's pretty good for free. So, you know, uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's something to keep in mind, so. I'll jump in on that too and say that one of the things I did find was that the textbooks that are out there um, for my field, at least my part of the field that I was doing this grant for creative writing, um, were not peer reviewed pre-production. So pre-publication, there weren't peer reviewed texts available that fit what my class needed to do. There was a very good one that's very, very old um, by a dear friend of mine, but it didn't fit my class. Um, and so one thing I think we need to be very careful about when we're looking and creating is to work that peer review process in. One, it can help us in our, you know, TNP kind of processes if we're in those, um, but also it just adds 
uh, a layer of accountability about our materials, which is really important. If I can yeah, also Patrick, chime. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, no, sorry. I just say, and it's in that collaborative spirit as well. Yeah, I agree with all of you. I think that's a really important part. I just have a thought, Anna. Um, so uh, I have a colleague who is from history department, and she was saying it's really hard for her to find any materials available. So she's trying to write what, and I'm sure other universities have, you know, historian uh, who are teaching the historical courses, especially I think one of the courses they're teaching is the history of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, is it possible like on the Ohio link, maybe um, you can create like a forum or something. So for the faculties from the different universities, if they have certain questions regarding to the OER and then if they can discuss within each other. So basically provide a platform so where the faculties can you know, communicate with each other. Yes. So we have, I put it in the chat a few ago. Um, we have an OER Commons site and all of these things that you all are talking about, I think we need to be doing on this site. So, you know, take some time and explore around there. There are faculty groups on it and they really haven't been used to the potential that they could. Um, so I would love to, you know, get together and brainstorm some ideas of how we could get those faculty groups going. And also all of you that are saying, oh yeah, I, I made, I created this OER because there was nothing there for my course. If you are willing to share that, I would love to put it in there and I will tweet out about it and put it on our afford learn listserv and get as many people to view it as possible because that's really what that site is about. It's building out resources for Ohioans and beyond. I mean, anyone can go to it, but I like to try to highlight Ohio faculty who have put things in there that have written things. I have some of the Cleveland State grant projects that they've created. Um, so anybody that wants to share anything you've created, please let me know. Um, and I would love to, to put that in there. Um, and you know, as you're going through these amazing projects that you're talking about and they develop, please let me know. Or if you want to put a collection of resources on there for a specific course, that's kind of what I was brainstorming as I'm going through this. Like each course that you all have done, maybe we create a collection for that course. And we can say, if you teach this, here are some resources you should check out. So I just, my my mind is is spinning as we're going through this. So thank you. Um, I did see sorry, one. Could you say oh, that again? Sorry, my Siri is talking to me. I did see one other question in here. How do OER texts get peer reviewed? So does anyone have a good example of an OER text that they've seen that was, is that something that that faculty member takes on themselves? Um, maybe sends it out to several faculty in their discipline or does anyone have a process for that that they've seen that's worked well? From what I've seen, it depends on the organization that you're working through. So for instance, OpenStax um, has its own uh, system, but I did not find it to be very subject specific. And so, so far, I'm not a huge fan, um, at least in my discipline. Um, I just posted and somebody else did too, that Rebus community is a, another one you can use. And that's kind of like a crowdsourced writing space. Um, and so you can ask for peer reviewers um, and they will jump on and, and do some of that work for you. So I think it really does depend on which, which group you're working with. Okay. Mandy's adding in the chat that they're experimenting with that process at CSU right now. So Mandy, let us know as you're going through it, what, what you learned from it and, and what we can pass on to others that are doing this work as well. She says, we'll do it. <laughs> All right, I wanna be conscientious and give people a break before the next session. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of my amazing faculty grantees, the ones on this call today and the others as well. It's been a really positive and eye-opening experience for me. The work that these people are doing with, you know, although it's a stipend, it's not, I would say, equal to the work that a lot of them have put in. So I appreciate you all going above and beyond um, and really making this a valuable experience for your own students. And I think what's going to be beyond your own students when we when we share out some of this work. So thank you again. 
All right. I look forward to the to the two o'clock session if there's nothing else. Thank you again. Thanks, Anna, for hosting us. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anna, and thanks to all the panelists for the informative session. Um, I would just like to remind everyone that there is a Slack channel that corresponds to this session. And if you would like to continue this conversation, that's a great venue for doing so. So thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you at um, two o'clock. Very good.